Hello and welcome to Swipe Coming Up. The future of films, how Hollywood is promising to make the cinema an ultra real experience. Gadget winners, we go behind the scenes at this year's T3 Awards. Smile like you mean it, the technology designed to cut down on your brushing time. And from Flashdance to F1, we get the adrenaline pumping in this week's games review. For quite a few years now, movie studios have been heralding 3D films as the future. Done well, like James Cameron's Avatar, the effects can undoubtedly be impressive. But are filmmakers losing the plot, thinking that audiences are looking for ultra-real experiences at the cinema? Sky's Katie Spencer has been finding out. Since the 60s, Olympic Studios in Barnes has had a strong association with sound production. Both the Rolling Stones and the Beatles made albums here. And now, with the former recording studio being transformed into a cinema, it's leading the way again. This will be one of the first theatres in the UK to get 3D sound. The new system, called Dolby Atmos, lets filmmakers design their movies to place sounds at precise points around the cinema. This is radically different and the sound will be just out of this world, something quite new. Sounds do appear from above and all angles rather than just at the front and the back and, and the subwoofer. So it's a, it's a real new dimension to, to cinema viewing. Immersion is the key and studios are sinking more and more money into the technology which they believe will keep audiences coming into the cinemas. But that doesn't just include sound. Hollywood's big budget superhero franchises like The Wolverine are often seen as leading the way when it comes to using the most cutting edge digital capture techniques. And the release of the next big X-Men movie in 2014 looks likely to be even bigger and better. Director Brian Singer has been exciting fans with his tweets about shooting in native 3D and simulcam, which hasn't been without its challenges for the cast and crew. The city cam operator was literally sweating. And of course, Brian Singer being Brian Singer, there was like 10, 11 takes and he wouldn't want to cut. Uh, I've never seen someone work out so hard. It, 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 it's big, it, the result is fantastic, but the, the cameras themselves are quite wide and quite cumbersome and heavy, so it takes a lot of planning. For many of the industry's top filmmakers who've been at the Zurich Film Festival this week, working digitally has become the norm. However, the look of a film is something that a lot of directors are keen to cling on to like on Robert Redford's new thriller, All Is Lost. What we did was take um, lenses that are hand ground and they're from uh, the late 60s, early 70s. As you put that old imperfect glass in front of a very, very high defini definition camera and it actually brings sort of an organic, lifelike quality. And action. Peter Jackson is often seen as one of the industry's pioneers. To get an immersive experience on The Hobbit, not only did he shoot in 3D, but also using a higher frame rate of 48 frames per second, twice the normal film standard. The look was ultra real, but divided critics, some of whom argued that the experience was distracting. If something is too good, too pin sharp, the super, it's too superficially perfect, your eye won't accept it and you'll notice it and it detracts from the story and getting immersed into it. James Cameron's 3D spectacular Avatar may be the highest grossing movie of all time, but in recent years studios have been finding out to their cost that making a movie in 3D doesn't guarantee a hit. However, with TVs in our homes getting bigger and better by the year, creating a more immersive experience in theatres is being seen as the only way to keep moviegoers coming back for their popcorn. Katie Spencer, Sky News. You're watching Swipe coming up. NASA takes 3D printing out of this world, but first. If there's an Oscars of the gadget world, it's the T3 Awards. Some of the biggest and best industry names come together to enjoy a glass or two of champagne. Sky's Martin Stanford went along to check out this year's big winners. At this year's awards ceremony in the City of London, the night belonged to HTC and the one. The HTC one. The HTC one. The HTC one. Three times in total, this phone and the company that created it received awards for design, phone of the year, and gadget of the year. So really, the whole metal back design. It took us 12 years, but we managed to fit the antennas in the back of the phone, so it really was something that took a lot. The new 2 terabyte Sky Plus box was up for an award, 
in the entertainment gadget category. To present the award, would you please welcome radio and television presenter Maggie Philbin. The winner is Sky Plus HD2. Thrilled that T3 has recognised the, you know, the incredible innovation that's gone into the Sky Plus HD box, and our latest box has got more storage than ever before. It's got Wi-Fi inside. It's connected to the internet. It allows our customers to access uh, the UK's widest range of catch-up TV and box sets on demand, and movie rentals, and, and of course Sky Movies on demand. So, um, you know, it's a great testament to the fact that Sky Plus just keeps on getting better. Apple were also multiple winners, with gongs for the iPad Mini and the MacBook Air 11-inch. And Sony did well. They won Best Camera for their NEX 6, and then it fell to me to announce the TV of the year. The winner is the 65-inch Sony Bravia 9005. The Tech Personality of the Year went to Jason Bradbury. A total surprise, and I'm so flattered. I feel really happy. <laughs> chuffed to bits. I'm such a big T3 fan. I've been reading it since way before the Gadget Show. And I, in, in a little way, I, 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 you know, I aspire for, the, for our content to, 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 to reach the sort of T3 level of detail. So to be holding this award means so much to me. And the tech moment of the year? It had to be that death-defying jump of Felix Baumgartner. Jump away. And the successful YouTube live stream that meant the whole world could celebrate his safe landing as it happened. Martin Stanford, Sky News. You're watching Swipe coming up. Why waste precious minutes brushing your teeth when you could finish the job in six seconds? But first, NASA announced this week plans to put the first 3D printer into outer space. It's hoped it'll allow astronauts to make any spare parts they might need during a mission. As Sky's Nicola Jude reports. Currently, all missions are reliant on supplies and equipment from Earth. Not only is that very expensive, but it takes time. That's why NASA has been getting excited about the prospect of printing what it needs in space in the hopes of providing self-sustainable missions in the future. It's been working closely with a tech startup, testing the equipment in zero gravity conditions to see if the printers will be able to operate in the hostile environment of space. If it's going to take you, you know, years to do a space mission and cost you millions of dollars before you can even put your thing up there and see if it works, and then you, you learn something from that, and then you go try it again. Um, you're looking at really decades before any progress can really be happening. Uh, our platform, once it's in space, is gonna really cut down on, again, the cost, the time, and the risks that are uh, required for any of these space missions. As well as helping create tools needed in space, the process could even be used to print food for astronauts. The space station is a, is a house in space and it's built up of, of, of simple things in many respects. And if you need a new component, a new, a new pipe for the cooling system, if you need a new component for the windows, for the joints, then there's no reason why this cannot be uh, sent up and printed that way. If it works, 3D printing in space could revolutionise our ability to explore the universe. Nicola Jude, Sky News. You're watching Swipe coming up. We dance like nobody's watching in this week's games review. But first, here's a roundup of anything you might have missed over the last few days. It's been a tough week for the makers of Grand Theft Auto V. Rockstar Games was forced to apologise after the game's online multiplayer mode was plagued with problems. Millions of gamers were left frustrated by server issues. If it wasn't failing to load, many players were being repeatedly disconnected when they did finally manage to log on. A support site has been set up to advise gamers on what's going on. I think this is just part and parcel of having a game which has a huge online component where you're trying to play with lots of other people. Now, GTA 5 Online is a huge prospect and really ambitious. And I wouldn't want people to be put off by this because I wouldn't want it to stop developers trying to be this ambitious in the future. You decide who wins. It's Watch out, MTV. YouTube is launching its own music awards show. Jason Swartzman is hosting and Lady Gaga, Eminem and Arcade Fire are all down to perform at the event in New York on the 3rd of November. Nominations are going to be based on some of the most watched and shared videos over the past um, year. Pretty exciting. 
BAFTA is changing its rules so that TV programmes, which are only broadcast online, will be eligible for its 2014 TV awards. It says the changes reflect trends among the viewing public. Fancy having the perfect smile in just six seconds? Well, if you can't be bothered wasting precious time scrubbing away each day, how about this? No, it's not something out of Alien. This is Blizzardent's 3D printed toothbrush. Custom made to the shape of your mouth, apparently all you need to do is just bite down and grind your teeth. Fancy yourself as a bit of a superstar on the side? Well, in this week's games review, we've been practicing our best Lady Gaga moves as well as enjoying life in the fast lane. Julia Hardy from SBTV's Games and Gadgets channel has been checking out this week's best releases. F1 2013 is obviously the yearly iteration of the F1 franchise. It's a game for people who love racing really, really seriously, but you can actually just pick up and play. Probably the most exciting thing though, they've uh, introduced an 80s classic mode or a 90s classic mode. In the uh, 80s mode, you actually get kind of an 80s dash as well, just to go, they've gone really detailed with it. So you can basically race as, you know, like Damon Hill, Nigel Mansell, Murray Walkers slipped in there. They've got him doing some commentary. You can play out scenarios from great racing battles through history. It sounds quite exciting and yeah, an absolute must for anyone who loves racing. A great way to end a legendary circuit. Just Dance uh, 2014 is out. Pretty self-explanatory. It's a dance game. Uh, it's cross-platform this time, so like connect, uh, move, and of course like, the Wii as well. It's actually quite fun, really. It's got obviously like modern day music, so you've got like uh, Nicki Minaj, One Direction. They're quite popular, aren't they? But of course, for us oldies, there's a little bit of Bob Marley, there's some village people. On some of the platforms, there's something called the Party Master, so you can basically pick the songs and make people do really, really stupid dance moves. It's all about just party atmosphere and everyone getting involved. Just a tip though, if you are a parent, never ever dance in front of your children or their friends. Rain is basically a downloadable title from uh, Sony Japan. You basically play as a young boy who sees a girl outside who disappears and then he sort of sees her silhouette, goes outside to follow her and the same thing happens to him. It's a very interesting game to play in that for a lot of the time you can't really see where you are apart from when you're in the rain. You're basically traversing this sort of wet and soaked city but there's also these monsters that are there that you have to basically avoid. Each little area is almost like a little puzzle within itself. It looks beautiful. You're not really told anything. You're just there and you have to kind of figure it out as you go along. So you want to play more to see what's happening. And obviously, Sony, you're going to be hoping it will be do as well as Journey, which, you know, won them a whole heap of BAFTAs. But I think it can pretty much appeal to most people. The Legend of Zelda uh, Wind Waker HD is a remake of the GameCube game, which is about 10 years ago now, which makes everybody feel old. It's a kind of action adventure, a, a bit of hack and slash. It's got some great combat, some really colourful and weird characters that you meet. And if you think you're a bit too good, you know, your dexterity as a gamer is a bit too awesome, and you think that you're just going to walk through the Legend of Zelda Wind Waker HD, um, they've introduced something called the Hero Mode. All the enemies are like doubly as hard and you I think it's that you don't find life around you have to kind of use potions so it makes it a little bit more difficult it's just a beautiful cute lovely little story that you'll just lose yourself in young and old that's it for this week remember you can catch up with the breaking tech stories all week on Sky News for iPad our smartphone apps and skynews.com see you next time bye bye